throw two at the end of the okay. Yeah. Oh, you've got coffee. You have to speak now. Uh, my name is Arnold Shore. I am a filmmaker, a screenwriter, a writer of comic books and graphic novels, and somehow I have fallen into the uh, remarkably flattering position of being editor in chief of Magi Comics, which is a new Jewish comics imprint from Source Point Press. Um, and that's who I am. I live in Massachusetts. I used to live in Los Angeles. I was born in Israel. And the rest of my body was pretty boring. So. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Danny Coleman. Uh, to quote myself from my website, I write stuff. Uh, I am a uh, primarily a comic writer um, and best known for this. This is the Unfinished Corner. It's a uh, middle grade fantasy adventure inspired by Jewish mythology. Uh, National Jewish Book Award finalist. I love that I get to say that. Um, yeah, and apparently. Who got the memo that we was to come dressed as the ten plagues? <laughs> so you've got to read the emails. Ah, married. Whoa. Okay, I'm Trina Robbins. Um, I don't really know where to start. Um, I grew up in a neighborhood in which we were the only Jews. So I've been an outsider all my life. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this is one of my books. This is based on my father's book, which he wrote in Yiddish back in 1938. And I had it translated and adapted it into graphic novel form. Um, it's stories about his childhood in the, in the old pre-war shtetls. Um, I've also written about Lily Renee, who was a golden age a woman cartoonist who escaped the Nazis. She was an Austrian Jew. Um, and I've written her whole story, which is right out of a comic book. Um, this was nominated for an Eisner, which is nice. And um, it's also been nominated for an award um, from the Jewish Comics Convention that's happening in New York in November, and the award is called a Juicy. <laughs> I, I guess that's all you need to know. I'm right. <laughs> I am Danny McGurk, and um, I'm actually involved with the Jewish Comics experience that's happening in New York, and I'm, oddly enough, the uh, chair of the uh, judges committee, which might explain that the $10 bill train just slipped. I don't know. I'm just um, <laughs> um, I um, wrote and edited a lot of comics for Marvel, Spider Man, Donald Trump, for Mauritius the Dazzler, and any human living who did. And um, relevant to this, um, this panel, I wrote a book called Disguise as Clark Kent Jews, Comics, and the Creation of the Superhero. And um, I wrote a biography. I guess a, a, I'm, I'm uh, gravitating even more than ever to like um, oddball Jewish Americans. So I wrote a prose biography of Stan Lee that came out a few years ago. Um, most people seem to think it was a reasonably fair treatment. And because um, it wasn't uh, stupid enough to try to write a book about Stan Lee, I thought I'd write a book about the Kennedy assassination. So, um, so my biography of Jack Ruby is coming out in November. I um, for better or worse, it's a very Jewish story. I have um, a lot of it is based on um, Jack's uh, rabbi's notes, and, and the rabbi Silverman visited him like every other day when he was in prison. So um, be on the lookout for it. Thank you. Oh, I just want to comment one more thing. Um, you can. My partner Steve Lailoha, who, believe it or not, is Judeo Hawaiian, has a table here, and he's selling these books because he's one of the artists who contributed to it. So if you want to get copies, you can get them at his table. And I don't know the number of the location, but he's sitting next to Scott Shaw, if that's any help. Um, we do have one more panelist who is 
trying very, very hard for me to not try to jump up on stage. Shalom! <laughs> for the record, I apologize to my esteemed colleagues here for being late. However, I am Jewish, and I'm on Jewish time even at Comic-Con. And the reason I'm on Jewish time at Comic-Con is because, if you don't know already, Comic-Con is the same as being in Shoal. Do you know what Shoal is? Shoal is a synagogue, right? So what do we do in the synagogue? We all gather together as a community, and we celebrate our faith by wearing traditional costumes. What do we do at Comic-Con? <laughs> okay, QED. Anyway, I'm Gorf, we're going to be Gorfinkel, which is frog backwards of at Jewish cartoon. I am, well, I guess my background is, as I said in the earlier panel, born, bar mitzvah, Batman, Ditafon, and beyond. And I am the author of the Passover Haggadah graphic novel, which is exactly what it sounds. It may not have a very original title, but it is a most original book. And that's enough for me. somewhat in the title of the panel, what is Jewish identity in comics? Um, I'm going to give you two minutes to have a drink and get yourself settled. So Daniel, if we can start with you, could you, could you define for us, please, what is Jewish identity in comics? What is Jewish identity in comics? Wow. Um, I, it's, it's somewhere in the Venn diagram between the Jewish creators and whatever subtext you know, certainly in previous years, in the, up, up until the 1970s, um, just sort of they coded some unconscious subtext of the characters. Um, kind of their approach to the world and sort of an ironic, um, boy, how, you know, it's, it's the, you, you, you can think I'd be ready for this question. Um, I guess, I guess the thing, and I, I don't know if you have the images of it, that um, for years in the 60s, <coughs> Stanley and Jack Kirby did the Mighty Thor comics. Thor is the um, quite um, Nordic looking Norse god of thunder. And, um, and yet he always wanted to marry uh, Don Blake's nurse, Jane Foster. And uh, Odin, who uh, Jack Kirby drew as kind of a um, biblical, almost like, uh, like Michelangelo's Moses, with the big beard. Um, you, you dare not marry the mortal woman. Uh, the, you know, it was, it was it, and this was, this was not a one issue subplot. This went on issue after issue after issue. Thor was like, Dad, but I love her. No, she's not an immortal, you can't. And, you know, going back and reading it as, you know, as a putative adult, um, I, I said, oh my God, this is like an argument about intermarriage, you know, and, and just went on. And then, of course, Stan married a very not Jewish uh, woman, and they had a marriage that lasted about 70 years, and Jack married the Jewish girl next door in Brooklyn. They also had a long, happy marriage. So, but this debate just seemed to be raging. So, so I think that's what Jewish identity in comics of that era, in mainstream comics of that era meant, that if you read between the lines, you can find it. Um, <clears throat> I don't think that I have the same. Um, it is true that in the 60s, I did read the Marvel comics and loved them, but I, I, I no longer am that fan, and I'm not really into superheroes. Um, you, you know, we all know that Superman is Jewish. That isn't, forget it, we know. Um, I, I think I'm much more into what is known as Yiddishkeit, which is Jewish culture. And it's really, well, like, you know, New York is all Yiddishkeit. You know, even if, if you're black, if you're Puerto Rican, you're still Jewish. Um, Oh, I think only New York, maybe some parts of New Jersey and Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> but California isn't really Yiddishkeit. But anyway, that's what I'm, I'm very interested in Yiddishkeit. I'm studying language, which is really a great language. Um, and I've written several books, you know, not just this one, but also a biography of Lily Renee. Did I mention that already? I did, okay. So, I mean, that's where I'm coming from. Go. <laughs> so, 
the, the joke we made on a similar panel last year is that all comics are Jewish. Um, because they are. Let's be honest, the, the foundations of the American comic book industry, uh, the, the founders of that industry were by and large Jewish, uh, many of them from immigrant families, uh, working in a period of time when being openly Jewish was not necessarily the best thing. Anti-Semitism was absolutely rampant. Um, it would be difficult to find employment, to get education, to, to sort of advance yourself. Uh, if you were to quote unquote obviously Jewish. And so, as Danny was saying, you see in so many of the seminal foundational comics of the American comic book issue, you see this sort of sublimated Judaism, that if you know where to look, if you can read between the lines, it is, it is dripping off the page. Um, with that said, nowadays, um, I think we're able, I think, I hope, we're able to be a little bit more, shall we say, out of the tabernacle about it. Um, and so I love to see and, you know, for 224 pages of open Jewishness, open Judaism that is sort of unapologetic and matter of fact, and this is who the characters are, and there's no, there's no turning away from that. There's no way you can look at, I've got, what, seven, eight stars, David, on the front of this book? There's, there's no, like, oh no, there's just a bunch of Yeah, it, I mean, it's a lot. Um, and I, I like to think that sort of step by step, page by page, we're getting to a place where Jewish identity and comics can be overt instead of subliminal. Uh, I mean, that's that's quite a declaration, you know, for you know Jewish comics, to, the Jewishness in comics to be overt instead of subliminal. I love that. Um, you know, the question about Jewish identity: what is Jewish identity in comics? Uh, when, when I was a kid, I was bitten by the film bug. I wanted to be a filmmaker, but somehow I ended up at Brandeis University, which did not have a film program. So I looked for the only major I could find where I could kind of make stuff up and still get a reasonable grade. And I graduated with a degree in philosophy. <laughs> um, so I think, to me, when I get a question like this, I, I really have to break it down into its component parts and try to understand them. Um, identity seems like a pretty straightforward thing. I mean, it isn't. There's a whole branch of philosophy about identity. But it's essentially, for lack of a better word, labelableness. Um, you know, when you're asking about Jewish identity, you're asking about, can it be labeled Jewish? Um, and then I get really stuck, because what is a Jewish? Um, can it be labeled? I, and I think like most isms, like probably any ism, Judaism and Jewishness and everything that it encompasses, uh, really can't be pinned down to any one thing. And the great fascinating mystery about it is that somehow it is still tangible. So what makes, what is Jewish identity in comics? It's when that strange, undefinable, unlabelable thing somehow makes itself known. Before I forget, I want to tell my esteemed colleagues here that I'm very honored to be sitting on this panel with you. Uh, Danny Fingeroff and I actually go way back. I think we worked on one Batman Spider-Man crossover at one point. I think so. Yeah, uh, Mark Bagley drew it. I don't even remember who wrote it, forgive me. Uh, Trina, you were mentioned. Dan DeMattis. What's that? Dan DeMattis wrote it. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, Mark DeMattis? Yeah. He's amazing. Yep. Is he Jewish? Uh, yes. Oh, good. We can talk about it. <laughs> Trina, I don't have the words. You are a legend, and I know people don't like hearing that, but it's absolutely true. You are on the vanguard of so many areas of comics that are so important, not only to Jews and storytelling, but to the world. And I thank you for everything that you've done and everything you're going to do. Thank you. We've never told you that about rectify that after the camera. <laughs> and Danny, your book is phenomenal. You are the future of Jewish comics. And the reason we're here is because she put all this together. So we're very grateful for your hard work to put this together. Our knowledge has been collaborating for many, many years.
years, and he is truly also the future of Jewish comics, both as a writer and a producer, and uh, I'm Gorf and I'm humbled. To answer the question, <laughs> and by the way, thank you, Sarah, for moderating this. Um, our, our honorary Gentile. Can we say Gentile? Is that the loud word? Okay, I always feel like it's somehow slightly derogatory, but it's really not. No, um, she's the token coin. But thank you. I was going to actually say that, but I'll leave that to you. For me, Jewish identity relates to the four children. How many of you here have celebrated a Passover Seder? Great show of hands. Okay, quite a few of you. Excellent. So for those of you who don't know, a Passover Seder is summarized like this. It's when we all sit down at the table together and we say they tried to kill us, we survived, let's eat. That's Passover. There is a parable of four children, the Arababani, and in it you have the wise child, you have what's known as the wicked child, that I'll say more like disobedient, and then you have the simple child and the one who does not even know how to ask a question. And historically, Jewish identity in comics mirrors that parable. Because in the beginning, you had immigrants that came over from a very traditional background in Europe. And yes, I'm talking about Ashkenazim specifically. The Spartan is a different story. We'll get to that later. And they began, they were the wise children. And they began the next generation, which was the disobedient ones. The ones that wanted to break the rules because they faced anti-Semitism. And they faced all kinds of barriers to being able to do the two, two equal rights in American society. I'm specifically speaking about American society. So let's put Siegel and Schuster, the creators of Superman, into that bucket right there. They wanted to assimilate. That's what Clark Kent was all about. That if you could only see me, I may look like the nerdy glasses, you know, the hat on and all that. But if you could only see me pull up in my shirt, you'll see that I have a big S underneath that I am super. And then they began the next generation, and forgive me, um, Danny, you would know this better than I, which is the Stan Lee generation. And they were the Tom, the simple generation. <laughs> uh, and uh, Stan did not have, as, as Danny was saying before, much of a connection to his Judaism, at least overtly, at all. And that began the last generation, which is the, you know, you were the Shul, the ones who didn't even know how to ask a question. They were so far removed from their tradition that the idea of putting their Judaism into comics was completely foreign. And now we are bringing it for full circle. The circle of Jewish comics! <laughs> and we are finally taking that medium that was created, conceived by Jewish people, a people who are not just the people of the book, but the people of the comic book. And we are infusing it with Jewish ethics and Jewish stories and Jewish identity in all its grand diversity. And we are on the cusp of something quite wonderful. So we thank you for your support, and we thank you for staying tuned, T-O-O-N-E-D, to the next generation of Jewish comics. And remember, make Judaism your superpower. I would just, I would just like to add that when my father used to do the Seder, and I was the little kid, when it came to the, one, the son who wits not to ask, which is what it was called, he always indicated me as the child that's <laughs> not to ask. Well, I want to I wanna kind of bounce off that a little bit because something that I've encountered in the time since, so The Unfinished Corner is my debut graphic novel. I didn't have any, any established career beforehand that sort of defined who I am. Um, and, you know, I wanted to come out gate with something, something extremely Jewish, and I did. Um, and when I started talking to my friends who have been in the industry for longer than I have, who have worked for Marvel DC and IDW and Dark Horse, and the big publishers, um, what I heard over and over again was some variation of, like, oh, I wish I could go back in time and give this book to myself as a bar mitzvah present. And I go, you're Jewish? How long have you been Jewish? How did I not know you were Jewish? Um, and it's, as, as we've talked in, in kind of the year and a half since then, as we've talked about this, and what, I've, what I've heard, the impression I've got is that a lot of these people, a lot of these creations want to put Judaism in their books more. And they're starting to sort of find the avenues that allow them to do that, even in the big two books, the superhero books, the capes and tights, and, and so on. 
But it is difficult because, again, the entire history of Judaism in mainstream comics has been this sublimation of it. Um, and so I, I joked that, you know, I was able to do this because I didn't have a career to ruin. Um, and it's, it's kind of true that I don't, if I had sort of 10 years of writing Justice League or, you know, Avengers under my belt, I don't know that I would have had the chutzpah to then come out and go, look at me, I'm Jewish. Well, so are my comics. I think you really, me. you really have to credit to a large degree Will Eisner for doing that. I mean, you know, not, you know, his great accomplishments, of course, of the spirit in the 40s, and then, you know, Contract with God is often talked about as among the first to popularize the term graphic novel. That's all the panel that said graphic novel first. Um, but the idea that he chose, when he could afford to do anything he wanted, the thing he chose to do was to talk about the Jewish rocks of the 1930s, of the Depression era, and so... Dropsy Avenue. Dropsy Avenue. Love that. And, and so not only was it this first, among the first major attempts to do a serious work, but it was a specifically Jewish work that I guess both focused, so I guess he knew that uh, Jews would buy it, but I, I, it, it, it's a brave thing to have put that out, even though he had nothing to lose, to, you know, technically. You know, that's a very good example of what I call Jew Yiddish cut, Dropsy Avenue. Danny, you said that you wish you had, you had had your book to get at your bat mitzvah. What the? Oh. We're, we're going to, sorry, the true Danny, yes, she, yes. and I. So we're going to recti rectify this right now. Danny, <laughs> Mazel Tov on your bat mitzvah. We're very proud of you, and we hope that you use this book to lead the next generation of Jewish comics. Please sing with me. Send it to This is the first time in the history I just want to point out, I do remember most of my bar mitzvah portion, so if we run out of time, oh, or if we run out of things to say, I will start laning. We're a bunch of Jews on the panel, we won't run out of things to say. We've been here 25 minutes, I'll ask one question. We're fine, don't worry. <laughs> I might actually just go and see the audience, to be honest. This is, this is fun. Um, but I do want to pick up on something you said earlier, Danny, which is about um, overt Jewish identity in comics. Um, and this is something that I know that we've talked about previously. There are a number of well-known Jewish characters in mainstream comics. Um, and I'm going to pick on you because I know you're going to tell me about this. What makes those characters representative of Jewish identity? Oh, let's get into it. Um, so here's the thing about mainstream Jewish characters. You know, you can probably name a handful off the top of your head. We've got Magneto, we've got Moonlight. We're going to talk about Moon Knight. <laughs> um, uh, Kitty Pride, um, Magneto's kids, maybe, um, and a, a handful of other characters sort of throughout the pages. Um, and the way we know they're Jewish tend to be one of two things. Either at some point someone just kind of said they were, and then by inference their children are, and so on and so forth. Or, they're Jewish because they went through some really bad shit. In Magneto's case, the Holocaust. Um, and I, I like Magneto as an example because he's probably the most famous uh, canonically Jewish character. He's the one of you know, name a um, comic book Jew, you go, oh, Magneto. Um, and the reason we know he's Jewish is because he's a Holocaust survivor. It's not because we see him celebrating Shabbat, or remembering his bar mitzvah, or, you know, breaking bread with his family, or, you know, saying a, saying a blessing over Kiddush. None of the things that make us Jewish. No, we know he is Jewish because of a specific massive trauma that the world associates with Judaism, and that really bothers me. Amen. Do we want to talk about Moon Knight? <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there's, a, there's an early Marvel Jewish character that 
never gets remembered, but kind of was pioneering in, in that, you know, you don't count Irvin Forbush. And then there was a character in a Steranko Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. story, a regular character, named Sidney A. Levine, who had the nickname The Gaffer. And he was like Hugh in the James Bond movies. He was there to put together all the gadgets. He was drawn, I mean, if you look at it, it's almost a kind of anti-Semitic caricature, but the intention, I think, on Starango's part was to, you know, never, you know, he had kind of a Brooklyn accent, but that's a character nobody ever thinks about, but that, that was the, I guess it was Izzy Cohen and Howling Commandos. Um, but after that, it's just, no, no mention was ever, I'm, I'm sure in the 50 years since, somebody has done an entire miniseries about Sidney Levine's background. But as far as I know, there was just a knit character who happened to be named Sidney Levine and spoke in that kind of distinctive Brooklynese. Well, all of Mad Comics, and I mean the comics specifically, not the magazine necessarily, all of Mad Comics was Jewish. I mean, you, you know, you, you couldn't get it unless you were Jewish or unless you understood Judaism or Yiddishkeit, really not Judaism, but Yiddishkeit. Let me tell you a story. <laughs> <laughs> I was the editor of Batman Comics, <clears throat> excuse me. I was the editor, I'm so choked up thinking about it. I was the editor of Batman Comics for the better part of the decade. And I work with an amazing team of people. We call ourselves the Bat Guys. Excuse me, I've got to say, I'm the Bat Guys. That's it. That's it. <laughs> that was my best. Oh. Michael, that was my best Michael Keaton ever, folks. <laughs> oh, and every Friday, I think it was, Julius Schwartz would visit the offices of DC Comics. Who was Julius Schwartz? Again, Danny Finger on the tell me much better than I, but I'll do my best here. Julie Schwartz was a fabled editor who created the Silver Age of DC Comics. He's the one who oversaw resuscitating the Flash, making the red costume, the Green Lantern, Hal Jordan, the circle, the yellow oval around the bat, which was really done, by the way, for trademark purposes. Another story for another time. So Julie, would, he, he was a big guy. And he was a big Jewish man, and I don't think I'm speaking out of turn to say that he, his, forgive me, but this really describes him, his nose was about as big as he was tall. And I don't mean that as an epithet at all, that's just who the guy was. And he would hold court in a room specifically set aside for him, Julius Schwartz, Emeritus DC Comics editor, and we would be invited to come in and talk to him. And people would, it, it was really like, you know, forgive me for uh, jumping to a different stream of religion, but it was like visiting the Pope and you come and you kiss the ring. It was that special. And I remember sitting in front of Julie Schwartz, and he was behind a desk just like this, and I was seated over there, and I was probably speaking in a high voice because I was really nervous. And I asked Julie, tell me, why is Clark Kent's Kryptonian name Kal El? Tell me that doesn't sound Jewish. After all, the word E-L stands for God in Hebrew. So where did it come from? I'm dying to know. And Julie gave me the answer. Would you like to hear the answer? <laughs> so would I, because I can't remember what he said. <laughs> and I'm so sorry about that. But the fact was, I was sitting there, and in my head I was going, it's Julie Schwartz, I'm sitting in front of Julie Schwartz, that I couldn't concentrate and remember. But I did ask my boss and sensei, Denny O'Neill, blessed memory, the man who coined the phrase Dark Knight Detective, about this question. And he said he doesn't know for sure, but it is entirely plausible because after all, Siegel and Schuster were children of immigrants, and they probably drew upon the Jewish tradition to create their character. So as far as I'm concerned, that's the origin of Jewish character and Jewish identity in comics. I'd be so there. <laughs> I, I don't have uh, you know stories about meetings with legendary figures, so it's a little hard to follow. For me, I are known. You are the new legendary figure. You don't need to stand on anybody else's shoulders. Yes, folks. 
they're, they're all applauding with this like dazed, questioning look on their face. Like, what are we applauding for? Um, gosh, now I have to live up to that. Uh, to me, it's it's a question that I carry with me as somebody who's creating new Jewish content um, and kind of bringing it into into its whatever its future is. Um, like the question that, that sits in my mind is, all right, so back then they had to bury this Jewishness in under subtext and sort of hidden, hidden kind of metaphors and whatever. Um, when there were overt characters, the characters kind of fell into very specific stereotype buckets. Um, regardless of whether they were positive stereotypes or negative stereotypes, they were just very narrowly defined buckets. This is what a Jewish character looks like and sounds like and talks like and this is how a Jewish character behaves. Um, and it feels like we shouldn't need to do that, certainly not anymore. Uh, and so what excites me to think about is who are the Jewish comic book characters and TV characters and movie characters um, of the future? Who, how, how can we expand uh, the way that we're depicted? How can we sort of broaden that palette um, because, yes, there are Jews who are victims of the Holocaust, but we're not only that. Yes, there are Jews who are, you know, secular New Yorkers with anxiety problems. Um, <laughs> but we're not all that. Uh, there's such a broader range of, of colors to choose from for this, uh, for this portrait we're painting. And to me, that's a, that's a very exciting thing to feel like we're finally at a point where, where that can happen, where we can start telling those stories. But this is sort of another side of the coin, of the, the depiction coin, the representation coin. Yes, we're creating this, these works. And yes, the, the voice of you know, creating authentic Jewish narrative and, and depicting authentic Jewish characters began you know, a while ago, we mentioned, of course, Eisner. Um, but I think there's another piece to this that's a little bit complicated, which is, um, how do we amplify that? There, a few months ago in the Boston area, which is where I currently live, there was a fascinating exhibit. Uh, the, this was at Boston University. The exhibit was called, Comics is a Medium, Not a Genre. And it was comics, art, from you know all through the history of, of comics and uh, all sorts of examples, right from the very beginning to some very contemporary stuff. Um, and as these things are, and as these sh things should be, it was curated with an eye towards diversity, with an eye towards let's make sure that as we explore comics as a medium, uh, that we show as much of the the range of who and what it can depict as possible. Uh, lots of fascinating examples of illustrations of female characters throughout the years in different ways. Of course, you know, blackness and Africanness. There's a whole section on Asian comics and how how Asian comics depict Asians and how they depict others. Uh, lots of fascinating stuff. And as I was going through, I began to realize, wait a minute, there's something kind of missing here. There are a lot of Jewish names in the captions. But I was looking at the art, and I could not find a single overtly Jewish character in the entire <coughs> exhibit, except one that had the face of a mouse. And I think that you know one of the things that we have to sort of grapple with and struggle with and try to find a way around is uh, you know this question of all right, so so we're broadening the palette, we're telling these stories about. Jewish characters who break some of these molds. Um, how do we do it in a way that gets that catches people's attention and that gets people to realize, oh wait a minute, there really is more here than what we thought there was. Um, there really is a a whole range of identities um, that can be expressed through this that we haven't engaged with yet, and that can be part of uh, and that should be part of this broader. Uh, you know, expression of, of you know diversity and humanity and all of that. Uh, I don't have an answer to that yet, but it's it's something that I've been thinking about. Yeah. Well, this is something that 
old Jews, I think, grapple with to some degree, which is that we are in many ways an, an invisible minority. Um, because many of us are, you know, white or white passing. There is the, uh, we worked very, very hard to assimilate uh, during, you know, the mid-century. Um, and in many cases did a pretty good job. Um, and there is certainly sort of the, the narrative that we, we frequently find we have to counter of, you know, well, you, you're doing fine. You control the media, you control the, you control the banks. What do you got to complain about? Well, the fact that you said that. <laughs> um, but, it, but it is tricky because it's, it's very hard to find, to find a way that, that sticks to say, yes, but we're a minority. We are absolutely a minority. We are in many, many ways still an oppressed minority. Anti-Semitism is absolutely rampant. I um, don't know if you've heard of this fellow named Kanye West and some of the shit he said. Um, and far too many people agree. Um, and we, I, I said this before, I'm going to say it again, what I want to see in media is I want to see us start to be treated like any other minority who deserve to have our stories told boldly, proudly on the page because we are underrepresented and we need to see ourselves. That's no different than any ethnic minority, any gender or sexuality minority. Um, it sh I want that same playing field for us. Part of the reason the prevalence of a Holocaust narrative, because it goes back to I mean a time when hey everything's great in Germany you know uh, what what could what could be better where can we be fitting in more and then of course not so fast so I think that is a way of reminding everybody that oh okay that current being okay and being accepted is no guarantee for anybody for any minority that. You will be in the future. Uh, one of the things about Jewish people, for one thing, um, I know that there are, of course, still lots of Orthodox Jews, but for the most part, we are just like anyone else. You know, uh, we look like anyone else. Uh, there are some exceptions where people do look like caricatures, you know, but. Um, most of I mean, look, I don't look Jewish. I was a blonde, you know, when I had a hair color. You know, we <laughs> have a big nose. Um, so it's, it's a very kind of, it's an elusive thing. I did a comic in the early 21st century. Uh, lasted a few issues. Go Girl, I wrote it, and it was drawn by my friend Ann Timmons. And um, her name is Lindsay Goldman. And that's the only reason you know she's Jewish, is because her name is Lindsay Goldman. But everyone knew she was Jewish, and there was even a thing on the internet about who would win in a fight, Kitty Pryde or Lindsay Goldman. <laughs> you know, so everyone knew. But she was, other, and other than that, she's just a typical teenager who happens to be able to fly, you know. And that's, we're just ordinary people who happen to be able to fly. Trina, you know the old adage how you can tell that superhero is Jewish, right? No. Goldman, Silverman, Batman, Superman. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that you brought up the, the idea of their, like, how we look again, that there's some people do have the, the features that we associate with, specifically Ashkenazi Judaism, some people don't. The, the sentence, you don't look Jewish, is one of my favorite sentences of the English language. And I say this, I say this as a linguist. It's an extraordinarily efficient sentence because in the space of four words, you've managed to insult my religion and compliment my face. <laughs> well done. So I, I'd like to pick up, if, if I may. Absolutely. Uh, on, on something that Danny said that I think is really important and that I'd like to expand on, and if you were in the panel, I thought, which, which Danny? Sorry, Danny with the eye. Um, I should specify, that's true. Um, so Danny with the eye said, um, we deserve to see ourselves in this content. And I feel very strongly about that. Um, in fact, 
my name is Thomas, the imprint that I work for, we are just launching a brand new, brand new thing. Uh, we launched the Kickstarter for it just like an hour ago, uh, two hours ago. It is a monthly Jewish comics magazine, which is really exciting. And um, one of the things that I talk about when I'm kind of pitching this Magid magazine is that you know when my kids and I go into a comic shop, we look around, we don't see ourselves, um, and that's kind of a weird thing. It's something that you know for people who see themselves as part of you know whatever the sort of dominant culture is, however you want to define that, you walk into a comic book shop and you're everywhere, um, but we're not. Uh, but there's another side to that that I think is also really, really important. And you know, for those who were in the other panel, I apologize for repeating myself, but this bears repeating. Um, when, so first of all, we are a tiny minority, uh, something like half a percent of the world's population. Uh, that is a fact that I find is forgotten most commonly by Jews, because we tend to kind of interact with each other and we see each other all the time, so we're like, yeah, there's plenty of Jews in the world, but really there are not. So most people in the world have never met a Jew. Um, and so the only impression that most people have is from what they get from popular media, from TV, from movies, from comic books. Um, and when that impression is narrowly defined, now I'm not talking about the pros and cons of the definition, I, just the narrowness of it. Jews are doctors, Jews are lawyers, Jews are from New York, Jews are secular, Jews are overeducated, whatever it is, and this is not counting all the other stuff, um, when those are the buckets that we fall into, it leaves a really, really big gap. And whether people realize it or not, they feel it. They feel that there's something that they are not being told about Jews. And now I want you to think back to when you're a little kid in a dark room, and there's that open closet, and you cannot see inside. And what does your mind sort of subtly begin to suggest to you? Those strange shapes, they might be moving, they might be monsters, they might be out to get you. Uh, right now, we are facing a strange crisis where we have Jewish characters in media all the time, but it's only a sliver of light here, a sliver of light there, and that leaves a whole lot of darkness for people to imagine monsters. And so our job, I think, as storytellers, as Jewish storytellers, as tellers of Jewish stories, as crafters of Jewish tales, is to shed some more light on that darkness, to illuminate it. It doesn't take much. You light a match, you plug in a nightlight, and suddenly that monster isn't so monstrous anymore. Um, so whether it's you know stories like The Unfinished Corner, whether it's stories like the kinds of things that we're putting together in Magid Magazine, um, I think that's really what we're doing. And of course, all of you play a critical role in that. I mean, we can stand here all day long and shout all sorts of stories, but if, if they don't get received by you, they, they don't go anywhere. Um, so I, I want to just make sure to emphasize that the stuff that we're doing now is really important. It's the role you play in amplifying it, in sharing it, and in taking it in it is very important as well. Um, and I've been on the soapbox for a while, so I'll be quiet. That's, that's absolutely fine. I have actually been given the sign we are running out of time. I, I saw those songs, I tried to ignore them. <laughs> um, I would just like to make one more comment. I mean, you were talking about how few Jews there really are in the world. I think that in the not so far future, um, there won't be very many at all pure Jews because Jews intermarry. You know, because we, we tend, and this is true, we tend to be liberal. And we tend not to think, oh, that person is black, or that person is Asian, or that person is Irish, and so I won't associate with him. You know, we associate with everyone. My partner um, is Judeo-Irish. I'm Judeo-Hawaiian, excuse me, Judeo-Hawaiian. But I didn't even know that, you know, when we started going together. I just knew he was Hawaiian. Then I found out his mother was Jewish. Well, there were so many, you know, there are, are so many half black, half Jewish people, you know, half whatever, Italian and Jewish, Irish and Jewish, you know, we intermarry and so there won't be any pure Jews. I, I'm not saying that it's alarming, I think it's wonderful. Just like someday, and maybe in the further future, you know, there won't be any blondes anymore because we'll all have intermarried. 
building off of what Tina just said, I think that there is a massive opportunity that everybody here has touched on to be able to inspire people in their Judaism and to maintain their Judaism as well. And that is using the power of storytelling to promote those kinds of positive images, ideals, stories, lessons, sacred texts. The sky really is the limit in this. And I hope that the same kids now who are so into Marvel comics without even realizing their Jewish origins will be into Jewish comics with Jewish heroes as well. And to that end, I want to invite everybody to do a follow-up at Juicy, which is the comic book convention that Dr. Mary Mora, who's sitting in the audience right now, has assembled for us in New York City in November. It's spelled J-E-G. And she has, and she has flyers. Where is right. the, will you stand up? I want to meet you. I've spoken to you over the internet. That really gives away. Thank you very much. Um, I'll come say hi. I can't too. I'm slightly concerned that they're going to cut our mics in a minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> never got to say that before. So could you all just quickly tell us where people can find you this weekend, where they can find you online, and where they can find your Kickstarters. Um, if you want to kick us off off, and then we'll just run down before we get booted out. I'm being given the wind up. Please don't quickly. Sure, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Gorf, which is frog backwards. Now you will never forget me. And I've passed around these sheets that have QR codes so that you can find me very easily. But if you take out your phone right now and go to Instagram or Facebook, I'm at Jewish Cartoon. And everything that I do now is at Jewish Cartoon. It's my lifeblood, it's my passion. And uh, to paraphrase somebody who was speaking just a minute ago, uh, it's everything that we want to do. And you can find me at arnonshore.com. That's A-R-N-O-N-S-H-O-R-R. -R. But don't waste your time doing that, because the more important thing is to support the, this Kickstarter for this Jewish comics magazine, Magid Comics. It's on Kickstarter. This is the QR code. We're also handing out these awesome little postcards with some images from our works that have QR codes in the back. And we will be downstairs in the, in the big the big room at 4 o'clock, booth number 3919. Uh, we're going to be doing a bit of a meet and greet. We, we're, we have some free stuff to give out um, and books for sale and all that fun stuff. So we're around all day. Danny, go. Great. Uh, I'm Danny Coleman. I'm all over the internet at Danny Wright Stuff. I am a free agent for most of the rest of the shows. You'll probably find me uh, on the floor. I have found doing these before that like the the jigs sort of tend to gravitate towards each other. Um, so. Uh, yeah, uh, and I'll be at Juice in November, so come see us. I too will be at Juicy in November. I'm very excited about it. I don't have a website, uh, but I am on Facebook and you can find me and ask me to friend you. Um, I don't have a table here either, but you can find this book at my partner's table. His name is Steve Leoloha. You can find me at the very cleverly named Danny at dannyfigueroth.com. Also on Facebook, uh, which is my main social media. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming I will see all of you at the Juice uh, Jewish Comics Experience on November 12th in New York. Um, and I would love to see you at your synagogue, Jewish Center, home, or wherever you would like me to come talk about Stanley, Jack Ruby, or comic books. So um, that's where you find me. And finally, Kiddush is sponsored in honor of Danny Coleman's bat mitzvah. <laughs> there will be a fine selection of Manischewitz and comic books. Is it gluten free? We will have the oat version that is gluten free. We'll have the allergic version, the, sorry, the anti-allergic version. And of course, we will have the anti-lactite version as well for those of us who are lactose intolerant. Ladies and gentlemen, your comments tonight. Thank you very much.